so that we can truly see the things that God wants us to see in life. If you, if you have your Bibles with me, I'd like to return to James in the second chapter, verses 1 through 13. James in the second chapter, verses 1 through 13. My brethren, have not the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with respect of persons. For there come unto you assembly a man with a gold ring and goodly apparel, and there cometh in also a poor man in vile raiment. And ye have, have respect to them that weareth the gay clothing, and say unto them, Sir, or sit, excuse me, sit thou here in a good, good place, and say to the poor, Stand thou there, or sit here under my footstool. Are ye not then partial in yourselves, and are become judges of evil thoughts? Hearken, my beloved brethren, have not God chosen the poor of this world, rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom, which he hath promised to them that love him? But ye have despised the poor. Do not, do not rich men oppress you and draw you before the judgment seat? Do not they blaspheme that worthy name of, the, of which you are called? If ye fulfill the royal law according to the scriptures, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, and ye do well. But if ye have no respect to persons, ye commit sin and are conv convinced of the law as transgressors. For whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. For he that, that said, do not commit adultery, and said also, do not kill. Now the, if, if thou commit no adultery, yet if thou kill, thou art to become a transgressor of the law. So to speak ye, and so do, as they that shall be judged by the law of liberty. For he shall have judgment without mercy, that, that hath shewed no mercy, and mercy rejoices against judgment. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, again, as we read your word today, Lord, we pray that you would take it and minister unto us, that you would open our eyes today as we have sung today, that we would be able to see how we should be as your people, that we be faithful unto your word, that we be faithful unto the calling that you have given to us, that we would stand out and be different among the people of this world, and most of all, that we would be obedient to you. We ask your blessings on the reading of the word. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, that's what, today I want to talk to you about how we see things and how we perceive things. You know, sometimes you can have two different people look at the same thing and come up with something totally different, can't you, of what they see and, and how they see it. And today that's one of the things that I want to talk to you about. God has given to us many things to be thankful for, thankful for and one of those things is our sight that God has given to us. There are many other things that God has given to us that are considered blessings or are things that God has that, that God has said, this is something I want you to have, and it is a blessing that we take for granted in life. But if we look at our, our sight, the, our physical sight that we can see with, it is a blessing, isn't it? It's not until you begin to lose it or, or you have problems with it till you realize, wow, I was so blessed what God has given to me, and yet I, I have taken it for granted. They say that as you get older, as, as life, as you get older, your eyes begin to get weaker. And as through the process of time, we've heard time has a way of changing things. Well, the same it is with the process of our bodies. As we get older, we begin to not be able to do quite the things. We don't bend the same. We don't hear the same. We don't see the same. We don't have quite everything we started with. But that is the process of time. And as we look through our eyes, sometimes they get weak. Our muscles get weak, and we have to wear glasses. Some have maybe been wearing them for years, but for those who haven't, they begin that process, and begins to tear down and you don't see as clearly as you should it seems that generally most people are uh, they're affected with that they're, the most things you hear are generally about people that are have eye problems generally is that far or nearsighted which never made sense to me how the, the opposite is you, you can't see up close to your far side that never made a lot of sense to me but that is the process a lot of people are are dealing with that in life and like i said this may be you but again, it's not always about physical blindness, is it? Today, well, I want to talk to you about spiritual blindness as well and how close they are comparable to the same. You know, we can, we can have physical blindness, but also we can also have spiritual blindness too. 
blinded by the world, keeping us from the real truth. But yet it seems that the world, to many people, seem to be so fine. Even though that we are blinded by the world and the things that the world seems to pull over our eyes, and many people fall into that trap and, get, and, and, and don't see clearly, but all they see is the world and how perfect it seems to be to them. But they are blinded by the, by the things of this world. Like I said, throughout this world, we've been facing judgment, people. Have you ever been judged by someone else? It's not a good thing, is it? We get judged on the way, what we wear. We get judged on who we are, how rich we are, how poor we are, maybe the color of our skin, where we go, things we do, who we entertain with, a number of things. We are judged in all kinds of different areas in life, and this is what the world does. The world has a way of judging how, how, who we are and how we look. And I want you to think about that. Sometimes, even as Christians, we judge other people. And, uh, and sometimes we don't even know it. Sometimes we fall in that same category because we've been oppressed by the world and all the judgment that we had to go through. But sometimes we find that rubbing off on us as people and we judge other people sometimes. The Bible talks about that, that we should not judge one another. The world judges us how we indulge in it. But if we look at the side outside the box, sometimes we are guilty of the same thing. Maybe it's not how we, we may not judge other people by how they dress or what color their skin is, but sometimes we judge other people in other ways in life, but what they say and what they speak and how the, how, what they know. We find other areas to judge other people. And, and, and so, you know, it may not be that they may not have the same capability we do, so we judge them because of that. But they may be better in something else than what we are. It's a, it's a fine line sometimes as people. The Bible tells us not to judge one another. That we all, you know, we accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. We are all together as one. Basically, it doesn't matter what we do in this life, does it? It doesn't matter who we are in this world or in this life. Once we've accepted Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, we are all on the same playing ground. It doesn't matter what we do, who we are, how much money we have, how little money we have. God loves us all the same, doesn't he? God looks at us differently, doesn't he? He looks as us if he doesn't look about what we wear or who we are or what we have done in this world, because to him it really doesn't matter. But what does matter is that we love him, that we have a heart for him, and not just any kind of, that we just don't love him in, in any capacity, that we just don't go to church and say we love him or, or do things in church or and things. But God wants people that have a genuine realness about him, a genuine heart for him, a true love. That, can pass, that passes all other love within this world, that we just love God with all our heart, that we would do anything that we have for him the way God designed us to be. God has called each of us to serve him. You know, there are two different visions in this world, and these visions, I believe, are also comparable to what I mentioned before about being far and nearsighted. Sometimes it affects us the same spiritually. They say that clothes makes the man. Is it probably not that the clothes makes the man, but the clothes make our opinion a man or a woman? Think about that. It's not the clothes that we buy. We spend a lot of time looking at clothes, don't we? Trying to get that perfect outfit. But oftentimes it's not the clothes that makes us. It's the opinion of someone else. They also say not to judge the book by its cover. And I've seen a lot of people, when they pick up a book, the first thing they do, especially if they've read for a while, you can tell someone it reads a lot because they go to the back and they read the back. This looks like a good one, <laughs> you know. But they look at the picture and then they flip it to the back. This is a good book. Not having any idea what's in the book. So many times we judge the book by the cover. And the same it is with us as people. What we see is generally the way that we judge. Have you ever heard that first impressions are very important? And they are, in many ways they are, because they make a lasting impression. And sometimes people are judged by what they see on the outside and not what's on the inside. Aren't you glad God doesn't do that? Seriously, aren't you glad God does not do what he sees on the outside, but he searches the heart and he knows what's in the inside? You know, when he picked his disciples, most people probably wouldn't have picked his disciples because of what they saw on the outside. But God knew their hearts. God knew they were men that would follow after him, would be faithful to him. Not without failure, not without, without things that would maybe be wrong in their lives, but he, yet he knew their hearts and knew that they'd be faithful to him. Today, that's what God wants from us. 
See, God needs to search our hearts and to find us pure and holy and genuine with that loving spirit that we want to serve, serve him with all that we have. That we're not going to be judgmental of other people, that we're, not, we're just going to go and to serve him and allow God do the directing of people's lives and allow him to be the leaders in our lives. And that's what's important. God tells us the, that we should not be the way, the way in the church, particularly when it comes to a person's wealth, not to show partiality. You know, that's important, that we don't show partiality over one person over another. Yeah, I believe that's really, really important. And James gives us the illustration of two people coming to church, one who, a little exaggerated here, but pulled up with a jag and is wearing fine clothes with an heirloom ring on his finger, and the other one does his shopping at Goodwill and a dumpster dance. You know, two different people, completely different lives, come into this church or any church. It's important that we don't have partiality among people. They call this story the hurt story because it, in many way, be a little, like I said, it's a little exaggerated, but it comes pretty close to what many churches would do, what many people would do when people would walk into the church like that. The one would probably be showed great consideration because there must be something important about him for what he has. And the other one may not be shown as much kindness. And that seems a little silly, and maybe you said, oh, this is not something that we do, but people do it every day. Not, I'm not just talking about this church. I'm talking about other churches, people in the world, society. We are judged by the way what people see on the outside and not what's in the inside. But I'm so glad that God looks at the heart and realizes who is genuine and who is not. And that's what we need to do as God's people, to look at other people with God's eyes. Have you ever, you've always said, that, you know, that we should be as children when we serve God. A child doesn't care who he plays with as long as he makes a friend, as long as he has some, a companion, as he doesn't care what he wears. Most of us couldn't even remember what our, our friends wore when we were kids. I'm sure that you really remember that. I was playing with so-and-so, and he wore jeans with holes in it. I'm sure we could remember that. But no, we, we, we was kids. We look at each other as when we grew up as someone to, to go out and a buddy to go out with, to play with, or to go fishing with, or to play football with, or just to do nothing, or watch TV, or you know, go shopping with my best friend, or whatever it is that you do as kids. But you generally don't really remember what they look like or what they wore, only that you made a friend. And this is what God does, so, so to speak, to us. He doesn't care what we wear. He doesn't care what we've done in this life, only that we may have, that we have served him and been faithful to him. That's what God gets his joy out of and his reward for those who are obedient and faithful to him. And he knows their hearts rather than what we wear. In Galatians 3, 26 to 28, you are the sons of God through faith in Jesus Christ. For all of you who are baptized in Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male or female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. You know, isn't that amazing? That we become before God, we all come on common ground. We all come and stand before the throne as the same as each our brothers and sisters, people behind us, the people in front of us. We are all together on common ground. We are there to worship God and to be part of the kingdom of God, which God wants to give to us no matter what. In Christ, all the outward distinctions that we have become almost nothing. It doesn't matter if we work with the finest clothes or we have gone to the goodwill and picked out clothes. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if we have dirt on our face. It doesn't matter if, 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 we, if we are just different, our skin color is different. It doesn't matter if we, if we have not, you know, been in the, do the same things in life or accomplish the same goals. God don't care about those things, but he cares about people who come to love him in life. And this is what we are supposed to do as God's people. To look at other people with Christian eyes and say, I'm so glad you're here. I am so glad that you came today and was a part of our congregation, able to come and to worship with us. That we together we can worship God and lift him up. Who, the, open our, God would just open our eyes that we can see those things that we should be doing. If you look in the Bible, Samuel was one of the greatest prophets in the Bible. And God called him to anoint a king when Saul would not follow after him. Saul was leaving away from God. So God told Saul to go to the, to the Amicites and to take everything and not leave nothing there. Don't bring back nothing. What did he do? He brought back 
king. He brought back some animals, things he wanted to save. To, and I'll, and I'll save this and this. And he rationalized why he could do that. That was his breaking point. Not following after God, what God had made for him to do. He saw in his eyes what he thought was good. Today we do the exact same thing today as Christians. We see in our own eyes what we think is good. Even though God told us not to do this or that, we rationalize and try to, to mold things and make things what we want to do and what we should see, and we rationalize these things. God has called us to be obedient to his word 100%. He even tells us if we, if we fail in one little area, we've lost it all. We failed in all areas. We are to be obedient to God's word. As Samuel came to anoint the king, new king of Israel, Saul kind of pleaded with him, please let me have another chance, so to speak. He's not really in those words, but that's what he was doing. He was pleading that he, that he would still be king and God would still be with him. But it was too late for him. Samuel went to Jesse and told him one of his boys was going to be anointed king. As we know, the first seven came up. It was none of them. One was big and mighty and great looking. Nah, don't want that one. Even though he probably would, he made it look good as a king. On the outward thing, but many would have picked him because he looked like he was a king. And so forth. And they went on down through the line. And then he asked, is there any others? He says, I have one more. A young boy out in the shed, tending my sheep. And they brought David in. And Samuel knew right at the moment that that was him. He says, the spirit of the Lord came upon David. And from that day, he walked with, with David. Because he was faithful, God knew his heart. God knew that he was the one, that he would rule Israel the way that it should be ruled. That he wouldn't judge others the, 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 only the way that God told him to do so. Today, as God's people, we need to have a, good, a heart for God. We need to have our eyes as God would see things through people. And realize it's not about the inward, but it's about uh, the outward, but it's about the inward things that they have in their heart and if they love God with all their heart but they are to be praised and to held up just the same as anyone else today it's important if you if you focus on your week you just went through could you honestly say that God would be pleased with you with your actions your thoughts the way that you that when he anointed king or David as king that this is who, who God really wanted he knew immediately because he had God's he had the focus he knew exactly what God wanted and God said this is the one today are we walking in the same path that God would be pleased with would God look and say these are my children these are the ones that I want to do this and this and this because they are faithful to me in all things in life. And David was exactly that kind of person. It says that Samuel no, went no farther to Saul. He didn't go back and talk to Saul anymore because God walked away from him. It talks about him being bothered by an evil spirit and how David was called into, to be Saul's armor bearer. It's neat how God works. Isn't, it? isn't that neat? Saul didn't really know what, I don't believe, nearly knew what was going on. But God had his hand in all things, as he has his hand in our lives. Somehow or another, we may not know our past in life, where we're going, but God has his hand upon us. He's carrying us. As long as we are obedient to him, we will not slip through his fingers. He has a grip upon us. And our path and our journey in this life will be blessed by God if we are in God's will. And throughout David's life, he was blessed, wasn't he? It talks about Saul being, being affected by an a, a evil spirit and how David would play his harp and it would go away. David, because he was so good at playing his harp, and God blessed that. But yet God was using David, raising him up to be the next king of Israel. Now if you look at your life, what is God raising you up to be or to do with your life? If we're obedient to God, what he has called us to be, God may be raising us up, preparing us, 
for something great and something mighty in your life. Even though you may be facing circumstances right now, you're not sure why I'm here, why I had to go here, why I had to do this, or why, am I, why did I have to face this in my life? But we have to keep focused upon God in all things and be obedient to him. James says that he wants us to see people even better than Samuel did, to see them as he sees them. In other words, we need to see people as God sees them. As we walk down the streets and we see thousands and thousands of people, if you've ever been to Baltimore, you see thousands of people everywhere. And some people, seriously, that you, you may not want to run into. But each and every one of those people, it's not how they're dressed. It's about each and every one of them as a soul for the kingdom of God. And that we should be able to see that. If you go pick apples on a tree, you go and you look and you think, wow, there's a nice one. I want that one. And you see a little ruddy one over here. And you think, well, I'm going for the big one because he looks the nicest. And that's some way what we do as Christians and people. We pick the nicest. But that little ruddy one over there may taste the best. It may be the sweetest apple in the whole tree. May not look the best, but it may be the best in the whole entire tree. Better than the one, the big one hanging there, because he just got a new fresh worm in him, and you don't want to eat him. They say the the worst part is finding a worm in an apple is when you only find half of it. And there's a lot of truth to that. Sometimes in life, when we find out that we have done wrong, it's because we've already we've already had half of it. It's important that we 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 ask God to open our eyes. That we can see clearly. That when we walk with other people and that we talk to them. That we see things clearly through God's eyes. And that we we don't judge other people. For how they are or what they look like. Realizing that people are judging us in the same manner. I asked earlier if you've ever been judged. It's not good to feel like you're being judged is it? It's not. Each and every one of us I would say. Would say no. I do not like to be judged. Nor does other people like to be judged by us. Search your hearts this week and ask God to guide and direct your paths. That's important, that God directs our paths, that God guides us in all things that we do in life. Whether we're we're young going through school, whether we're older in life, God still has a purpose and a plan for you, and he's still giving us eyes that we can see, not just physical eyes, but spiritual eyes, and allow God to open our eyes that we may see how we can witness to other people, how we can say kind words to other people, how we can lift other people up, even if they're not people that we really want to be around. God still has a purpose and a place for them. This week, I, want, I really want you to, to go in prayer. Ask God to guide and direct your path. And read your Bible more. Always read your Bible more. That's important. Let us pray. Our precious and heavenly Father, today, Lord, as we look to you as your people. Sometimes in life, Lord, and sometimes as Christians, we fail you many times over, Lord. In a number of different ways in life. We pray, Lord, that you would open our eyes, that we may see the things where we have faltered in, Lord. That you would mold us and make us into the people that you've called us to be. That we would humble ourselves and stand before you, Lord, and allow you to search our hearts, Lord. And that you would open our eyes that we could see clearly, Lord. Wipe away the things of this world that that we don't fall upon the pressures of this world. And see the world so fine and grand as it tries to make it out to be. But we would, that you would open our eyes that we could see the real truth. That we could see the realness of the things that we should be about as your people. But most importantly, that we could be people that you would be pleased with. That we could stand before you and you would say, you would find us pleasing and and faithful unto you. Today, each and every one of us, I pray that you would guide our paths and that you would search our hearts, Lord. We thank you again for your love and your mercy. In Jesus' name, amen.